So I made a about three pages of genetics notes, hopefully to clear things up for you. Um, so here's page one, and then I'm going to zoom in to each one. So we're going to look at Mendelian genetics. And so Mendel got really lucky in working with pea plants because the traits he was working with did not have multiple alleles. They were only two options. They either had purple flowers or white flowers. They were tall plants or short plants, green or yellow peas, smooth or constricted pods, etc. The seven traits he worked with all just happened to be um, dominant or recessive, and that's how he figured out and actually coined the terms dominant and recessive. Um, and they only had two options. There wasn't co-dominance or incomplete dominance or sex-linked or polygenic. It was all straight up autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. So he got real lucky that those were the traits he happened to be studying. And so therefore, he was actually able to determine that some traits are dominant and some traits are recessive. So for example, if he made a purebred or true breeding line of tall plants and then a true breeding line of short plants, um, he would find that all the F1 were tall. And then this information would tell us that tall is the dominant trait. However, when he'd cross two F1s, so a heterozygous tall and a heterozygous tall, short plants grew as well as tall plants and in a three to one ratio all the time. For all of the traits he worked with, he consistently got a three to one ratio. So if he did purebred or true breeding purple flowers and true breeding white flowers, all of the F1 were purple. Um, and so when he crossed them, um, he would find, and so I should also mention when you say crossed, if you see like, um, like two F1 are crossed, that means their heterozygous and a heterozygous are crossed together. Uh, that's how you get that three to one ratio. There's three purple for one white. Now, all of Mendel's F2 generations grew in a three to one ratio. And that's what helped him to figure out, wow, that recessive trait doesn't actually disappear, even though it doesn't show up in that F1 generation, it comes back and appears in the F2. So because of this, Mendel was able to figure out um, his first law, the law of segregation, which states that alleles separate when gametes are formed. So he actually concluded that we have two copies of each trait. Um, remember, he didn't know about chromosomes or DNA or diploid or any of that. And that's why Mendel's so amazing. Um, but he actually figured out that when gametes were formed, each gamete has only one copy. So when we do Punnett squares, that's what we're writing at the top. What is possible in that organism's gametes? Um, but like what's really happening? So here you have like the, the plants as well as us, we are diploid organisms. So what we're saying is if you are dominant, you make the mRNA and the protein that causes that phenotype. Whereas this, oh now the flower appears purple because it's making a purple pigment. Now if you're heterozygous, well maybe it's um, the absence of that purple pigment. So there's no mRNA and there's no protein made. And so now this plant is heterozygous, but it has that dominant allele, so it makes that purple pigment, and now it's purple. And so if you have a homozygous dominant flower, uh, they're going to have two genes being expressed. Ooh, I don't know what happened there. Um, you're going to have two uh, genes being expressed, making that purple pigment. A heterozygous, just one chromosome will be making that, or coding for it. And then in a homozygous recessive, they both um, are not making purple pigment. So now it's a white flower. So that just gives you a little um, protein synthesis mixed in with genetics there for you. Okay, so now Mendel, though, he also was interested in looking at how the two traits kind of went together. So here we go. Mendel, um, when he crossed plants with different traits, um, so for example, like flower, color, and height, uh, or any combination of the seven traits he worked with, he found that the flower color doesn't influence the color of the peas, which means you could have a purple flower with green pea, a purple plant, you know, purple flowered plant with green peas, or a purple flowered plant with yellow peas. They didn't matter, or that the plant height doesn't influence a pod shape, etc. So what he was basically figuring out was that these traits are inherited independently of each other. So here, what that means is the trait for a flower color is on separate chromosomes than the trait for height. So here, if we have a heterozygous purple plant that is short, that would be the genotype. You can see how the 
flower color alleles are on one set of chromosomes and the height are on a different set of chromosomes. Now if you had yellow peas are dominant to green peas and a heterozygous yellow tall plant with purple flowers, also hybrid for purple color. So if you read something like this and all of these are, on, are independent of each other, that would mean you're looking at three separate sets of chromosomes. So in humans, we have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. I'm not really sure how much a pea plant has, but this would be three of those pairs. And you can see how the yellow um, versus green alleles are at different loci than the purple or white flower gene alleles versus the tall or short alleles. They're all inherited independently on different chromosomes. So when we say that traits are inherited independently or on separate chromosomes, this is literally what we mean. So if we were to um, draw this out, let's go ahead and uh, look at, I think I have this picture um, zoomed in more clearly. So here, if we were to look at this, the flower, I'm sorry, the pea plant I was describing was heterozygous for all three of those traits. So we could have this combination you could have a heterozygous for a pea color, yellow and green, heterozygous for flower color, heterozygous for height. Now when these separate during meiosis, Mendel's law of segregation, you'll get some gametes like this and some like that. Now keep in mind this is not have this is not showing us crossing over. This is the very basics. And in real life you would have them duplicate um, and then they would double and then these would separate, etc. during meiosis. Um, but here, in Mendel's Law of Independent Assortment, this is also possible. You could put the dominant yellow allele on the right instead of on the left, etc. So now you would have a different combination in the gametes. Or you can have this, have the white allele be on the left and the purple allele be on the right. And now the tall one's on the right and the short one's on the left. Each set of chromosomes here are independent of the others so how they move to the middle of the cell during meiosis doesn't influence each other. And that creates different combinations every time meiosis happens. So every time this plant goes through meiosis and makes gametes, there's different possibilities. I'm only showing three right here, but there's lots of different combinations. In humans, with our 46, I mean, sorry, our 23 pairs lined up, we have 8 million different possibilities. And that's not even counting our crossing over creating variation. So let's go ahead and see what this looks like in meiosis. So if I were to take, I'm taking this um, plant right here, and I'm going to put it into uh, meiosis. Actually, it could be any of these, truthfully, but uh, here we go. So if we look at interphase, you see that we have two copies of each gene. Um, even though they're different alleles, like this one right here is tall, I mean yellow, and that says green. Um, but there's two of each one because it's a diploid organism. So you can see how there's two. Um, and then this is G1 interface. Oh, shoot. And, oh, man. Um, oh, I'm in paint. <laughs> uh, you can see here we're in G1 or interphase. Then in S phase, the chromosomes duplicate. So now these are two, like, capital Ys. Um, here's capital Fs. So now you have sister chromatids attached. Now, later on, at the end of meiosis, you're going to have um, four haploid cells. And if you look, here's one, two, three, four of each gene. So that's how you're going to get four cells with only one copy each. Hopefully I'm not confusing you too much. So here's S phase. Um, the, the, the chromosomes duplicate, and now you have sister chromatids. Then we go into the beginning of meiosis. And this is where the homologous pairs or the matching chromosomes are going to pair up. So they find each other. So this one has the genes for flower color, this has plant height, and this one has pea color. And they find each other and they pair up, and this is also where crossing over is going to occur. Now, I didn't show crossing over in this diagram, but know that these sister chromatids that are touching will be crossing over, um, increasing variation. Now, the next step is that these homologous pairs are going to move to the middle of the cell. Now this is Mendel's law of independent assortment here um, because like I saw on the previous slide, like these dominant, oops, purple alleles could have very easily ended up on this side. And so how they move to the middle of the cell 
is um, random and unique every time. Now, our next step in meiosis are these homologous pairs are going to get pulled apart. And so you can see um, that the Y, the F, and the T alleles are not linked. They are all on separate chromosomes. And right here, this is now Mendel's law of, or starting Mendel's law of segregation. Uh, the alleles are going to separate. And then these are spindle fibers. Oh my gosh, the alleles aren't separating. The homologous pairs are separating. And then you can see here that cytokinesis occurs. And then we need to uh, have the chromosomes move to the middle of the cell again. And now here's Mendel's second law, the law of segregation, where the alleles are going to separate. And now you have your four haploid gametes. And so that is meiosis showing not linked genes. Now this is just a blurry picture of that. So now let's pretend that um, you have a true breeding purple tall plant. So true breeding purple tall is crossed with a true breeding white short plant. All of the F1 are purple and tall. So the F1 are test crossed. Test crossed means you're crossed with a homozygous recessive for both traits. So the F2, um, like how would you find this? So here's our cross, here's our F1 test crossed. You would actually set up a dihybrid cross. So here, if we zoom in, here is our dihybrid cross. You wouldn't have to keep on doing this because it's just going to repeat. And what we find is that 25% of the offspring will be tall and purple. 25% will be purple and short. 25% will be white and tall. And 25% will be white and short. That is our expected. And this is if the genes are truly inherited on independent chromosomes. So if when I look at this, so here's uh, my heterozygous parent um, for both traits. These are the gametes that can be made by this parent. So that's what went up at the top of this um, dihybrid cross here. So if I go back, so here's the um, hybrid parent, the F1, and here's the test cross parent. All the gametes are uh, little f and little t. So if um, they truly were, in, sorry, on separate chromosomes, this is what we'd expect. However, what happens if you, um, you would expect if you had 600, let me clear this off. If you had 600 offspring, you'd expect 150 to have each phenotype. So if I was doing chi-squared, I would, my expected would be 150 for each. Now what happens though, if my observed, I have 267, 263, 38, and 32. That is not my 150, 150, 150. I have these two that look like a parent, and these ones don't. So, and when I say looks like a parent, I mean looks like this parent and looks like that parent. So let's see what's happening here. This is due to linked genes. When you see data like this, it's because the genes are linked. So here, that means that my heterozygous parent that had um, purple flowers and tall, that purple and tall were inherited on the same chromosome. And then here's the other alleles because they were heterozygous. So here's the recessive for white and short. And so the other parent that's test cross, all the gametes look like this. So when I look at um, what's happening, if I take and cross um, this parent with this, with one of the gametes, the offspring are going to look like this. If I take this parent or this gamete mixed with this one, the offspring will look like this. So earlier when I said that they look like the parents, that's how we formed this one and this one. Those were our parental. Now, but what about those ones that were in the middle? Well, that's due to crossing over. Because they were linked genes, when they cross over right here, this uh, sister chromatid is going to have the dominant purple with a short, and now this one will have a white with a tall. So now these are what's going to form our recombinant offspring. When they, they fertilize, so here I have this purple and short gets fertilized by the sperm that was white and short. Well, now I'm going to have a purple short plant. And when this one gets fertilized, I'm going to have a white tall plant. And so these are our recombinant offspring, and they're the results of crossing over. And that's how you can tell if genes are linked or independently inherited.